Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Mindful Hunter Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel, and we're going to dive right into it this morning because it is 4.30 in the morning on Friday, and typically I upload these on Thursday. So that's a testament to exactly what's going on in my life. Um, kind of interesting. I, I may have talked myself out of doing a podcast this week if it hadn't have been for the response last week of going on the EXO podcast. I got to give a really big note of appreciation to both Steve and Mark for having me on. Uh, Really big impact as far as my own podcast and the YouTube channel goes. Uh, Just awesome response, super positive overall, lots of new eyeballs on the YouTube channel and tons of downloads on the podcast. Mindful Hunter has never really had one of those inflection points where things just take off. I've been grinding at this thing since 2017. I put my first videos up for Mindful Hunter. So, you know, a little bit over five years and, you know, just to put things in perspective. So it took me five years to get 2000 subscribers on YouTube. Now, albeit this is a side project of mine, And, you know, just slowly chipping away. I'm sure you could have done it faster if you'd have put more energy into it, but lots of other things going on in life. And then in the last month, since I put up the backpack review, I've got 500 new subscribers. So I'm at 2,500 now. So my YouTube subscriber base went up 25% in the last month. And about half of that I attribute almost directly to the EXO podcast. You know, I'd gotten about 200, 250 just from the review itself. And then once EXO had me on, in the next few days, I got another 250. So i just really appreciative of that. And to everybody who's new to the podcast, welcome. Here's the deal. Really informal relationship here. So if there's something you guys need, just let me know. If there's stuff you want me to cover shoot me an email, j at mindfulhunter.com. Add me on Instagram and send me a DM, mindful underscore hunter. Uh, and here's my promise to you guys. I won't bullshit you. I won't be bought by brands and give you an opinion that was paid for. Um, I will be honest and transparent. I'm not going to say there's not some kind of like brand partnerships in the future. You know, the pack review went over so well. Uh, Quite a few brands have already reached out wanting to send me stuff for review. And the good brands are all very, they're having a lot of integrity about it. Like, listen, we don't want to influence your opinion in any way. Just want to send you some stuff, see what you think about it. So I will be 100% transparent with how I got stuff. And I'm thinking that you know, if I'm given gear for a review, I might just do some big giveaways every few months because if I'm giving the gear away, <clears throat> then I can't be seen as being like inappropriately incentivized or stuff like that. So also though, when I test stuff, sometimes I beat it up a little bit and I don't want to give people beaten up gear. So I'm, I'm just going to see We'll play that one by ear, but I'll figure out a system where we can be transparent and we can make sure that the incentives are in line with the purpose of the channel. And the purpose of the channel is analytical, thoughtful, unbiased reviews paired with, you know, stories and films of hunting adventures. And then obviously whatever else I got going on in my life, which happens to be bodybuilding right now. So, so to get back on track, that's part of the reason a, why this podcast is, is late and B why I'm doing it at four 30 in the morning. So I'm two weeks out from a bodybuilding competition, five weeks out from a sheep hunt business is booming. Um, for the newer podcast listeners, I'm a business strategy consultant. I focus primarily on human behavior, behavioral economics, behavior sciences, shit like that. Yeah, and got a bunch of projects for a bunch of clients and I'm trying to clean my plate up here in the next, you know, week, week and a half so that as I come into the bodybuilding show, I'm just completely focused and I don't have any distractions because I can already tell my mind is not as sharp as it should be for what, for what I do for my clients. So 
yeah, I just have a ton of shit to do. So I thought to myself, I was supposed to do this yesterday afternoon. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm 43 now. And when I was in my 30s, I used to do a ton of work in the early evenings. Like I, I felt very sharp and I felt very focused. I think also not having a kid was a big difference. Uh, now, as soon as like four o'clock hits five o'clock, cause I wake up early, like four 30 every morning, as soon as four or five hits, like I'm done, the head shuts off. And I know any real intellectual tasks that I try and take on, I'm just going to half ass it. Like I just don't have that sharpness that I do earlier in the day. So I, I normally just shut her down and then restart early in the morning. So as I said, I was going to do this yesterday afternoon and I just wasn't feeling it. So I said to myself, I'll just wake up a little bit extra early and bang it out in the morning. Um, I should introduce the podcast. So what we are essentially going to do, and it could be a bit of a quick one this morning, is we are going to go over <clears throat> camera and film gear for the backcountry. And we're going to approach this a couple different ways. I'm going to give you kind of like a good, better, best scenario. First, we're going to run through everything I own. I And I'm not saying this to be arrogant, but it, that would be like the best case scenario. That's you spending a shitload of money on gear, really good stuff, knowing exactly what you want and making no sacrifices. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll lay out two alternate scenarios for different budgets with ultimately, and I'll, you know, let the cat out of the bag right now, the cheapest scenario is your iPhone. And there's a, you know, you could do, you can film fantastic, um, adventures. You can make great memories, take really good pictures with your, with your phone these days. So if you don't have a whole bunch of extra cash and you've got a decent phone, that's really all you need. But I also believe that with a minimal investment from there, you could really up your game and it's just fun. You know what I mean? I think I've told this story on the podcast before, but one of the kind of indirect benefits that I really appreciate from filming and photographing my hunting adventures is that I used to go through pretty intense bouts of depression when I got home from hunting. And there's a couple reasons. I've had a lot of time to think about this. One was it, obviously if I was unsuccessful, I take that shit really hard. I'm trying to work on that and not take it so hard. But I also on one hand like it because I hate this you know, well, we'll just go out and see what happens. And I think that's a cop-out. I think you're kind of giving yourself permission to fail before you even leave. I don't think it's good to only enjoy yourself if you kill something. But in the same breath, let's be honest. My goal is to go kill something. That's why I'm going on a hunting trip. It's not to go camping. It's not to go sightseeing. It's not to hang out with my buddies. And other people may have different motivations. But for me, I'm going out there to kill something, try to kill something. And when I fail at that, it hits me hard. I've gotten a little bit better at it over the years. I think too, now that I've started having some regular success, I can give myself permission to fail a little bit more easily because I recognize now that it's not always 100% my fault. There are situations and circumstances outside of your control hunting. And that's one of the things that I love about it the most is that no matter how good you are, you can still fail. That's kind of the beauty of hunting. You know, dudes like Remy Warren and, you know, legit studs go out there and, and fail regularly because, you know, weather, wind, animal behavior, other hunters, just shit that's outside of your control. So that was one reason why I used to get really depressed. The other reason was, and I don't know who else can relate with this. I feel perfectly at home on the mountains. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. The best phrase I can come up with is that I feel more me when I'm in the mountains, particularly alone than I do anywhere else in my life. Everywhere else in my life, I feel like I'm trying to like figure things out or know who I'm supposed to be or how I'm supposed to be with people. I don't, I, I don't 
you know, naturally do well with other people, the people who are close to me in my life, absolutely. I'm a fairly introverted person and those deep relationships I feel very comfortable with and I feel very authentic in those relationships. But as far as like random acquaintances and seeing people and doing business and networking, like I'm always, I always feel slightly uncomfortable and like I'm trying to, like everybody else knows something I don't and I'm trying to figure it out. And that all disappears when I'm on the mountains. And when I'm in there, it's like, I know this is what I'm supposed to do. And so when I have to leave that and come back home, there's this, there's this sense of depression. Like I feel like I should have done a better job at figuring out how to live my whole life out there than I did early on in my life so that I didn't have to come back. Um, so that I had a life that would let me, you know, maybe be an outfitter or something that would let me spend more time in what I feel is my natural environment. So that coupled with the failure thing, I mean, I used to, I used to come home just a bear. Like it was, it was pretty bad. I mean, to put things in context, it took me five years to kill my first elk. And it got to the point where my wife had to sit me down and she's like, listen, dude, you go away on these big hunts every year. It's very challenging. She has to look after the kid by herself in the house. She was always very tolerant. And she's like, I don't mind doing it. And I'm glad that you're doing what you love, but you can't come home like an asshole. Like you got to come home and be present and be like, okay, you had your adventure time to get back to real life. And she was hundred percent right. And one of the things that's helped me in that regard is the photography and the filmmaking. Because when I get back, I have this like week of processing all the data. I get to edit the pictures. I get to put the film together. I get to relive all that stuff. And it's a way of kind of extending my time on the mountain and feeling kind of closer to it. And so that, I I don't think that's a benefit that can be overstated. I think that's really important to figure out, um, yeah, what's important to you and what type of activities make you feel closer to to being out on the mountains? It m- might not be photography and filmmaking, but I mean, who knows? Whatever whatever your thing, whatever. Maybe it's writing, you know? And when you get home and write about your stuff, that kind of takes you back out there. Could be anything. But anyways, um, that that really helped. So let's get into the actual gear list. So I'm literally going to run through this like a grocery list, and then I'm going to back up and kind of explain some things. So my main camera is a Sony A1. On that, I have a Deity shotgun microphone that is a is a dual mic microphone. There's a, there's a microphone at the front and one at the back, and there's a switch on it where you can turn them both on or just the front one, or just the back one. The reason that this is a really interesting mic is that for those of you who've used like a Rode Video Micro or a Rode uh, Go or any of these like regular shotgun mics, when you're holding the camera and pointing it at things and talking about things, you're talking into the back of the microphone. So your voice comes out really muffled and much quieter than what's going on in the rest of the scene. So when you're trying to like point it at the landscape and 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 give a little play-by-play of what your plan is or what you've just done, it doesn't sound great. So with the Deity mic, you can turn on the back mic and then when you talk, it goes directly into it. Now, with all that being said, I recently picked up a new camera and as part of a little bonus for buying the new camera, and I'll get into that camera in a second, it came with the new Sony Bluetooth shotgun mic. So it's just like the Rode mic in that it's a shotgun mic that mounts to the hot shoe on the top of the camera. The reason that's called a hot shoe, by the way, is that it's a little flat square slot where you can slide things in like a flash or a microphone on the top of the camera and it has power and data running to it. And that's why it's called a hot shoe. If, if there's no power running to those particular slots, they're called cold shoes. Now, this new microphone, the microphone part of it clips off of the camera and then it turns into a lapel mic. So you can just slide it and it's pretty small, you know, maybe two, two and a half inches long by three quarters of an inch wide. 
and uh, like the size of one of those old school white engineering erasers. And then you can clip it onto your shirt and it works as it backs up as a lapel mic. And so I'm going to take that this year because I'm, that to me is even better than this. Cause to be honest, I would forget to turn off the front microphone and turn on the back microphone and do all that. Like, so the deity mic had the features, but I didn't take advantage of them fully. The nice thing about this Bluetooth mic is that especially when you're in a situation where you could be close to animals and you're trying to be quiet about giving your update and telling you what's going on. I used to have to hold the camera super close to my face and kind of whisper into the camera. And even then, if there was some wind, you're never quite sure if it's picking it up. But with this new mic, I can just clip the mic off, clip it onto my lapel, give my brief little update, and then put the microphone back on. So I'm pretty excited about that. For my main lens... It is a 24 to 70 mil f2.8 Sigma art lens. Now I'm actually upgrading that and it's supposed to be in in the next couple of weeks. Sony just announced their new 24 to 70 G Master version 2, which is right now there's two I would I would call like alpha lenses in the 24 to 70 category. And one of them is the Sigma G Master version one. And the second one is the Sigma art lens. I'd say they're almost identical in every way, except the Sigma is significantly lighter. And the new G Master is even lighter yet by, I think, almost half a pound. I think they've shaved 200 or 250 grams from below the, uh, the Sigma version, which was lighter than the old Sony version. And one of the themes you're going to see here is that filming and photographing in the back country is, is this an exercise in compromise because you're always trying to carry as little weight as possible. So for the first few years I was filming, when I was taking decent gear, I would shoot everything on a 24 mil prime lens. Now a prime lens is any lens that only has one focal length. So it doesn't zoom in or zoom out. It's just stationary. Now there's some real benefits to prime lenses. Normally they're cheaper for better glass. Getting alpha glass in a zoom lens is really expensive. Getting alpha glass in a prime lens is normally not that bad. It's still really expensive, but it's not nearly as expensive as a zoom lens. Um, And it's significantly lighter, like way, way, way lighter. And you can think of why there's no moving parts inside. There's less lenses, all all kinds of things, but it really reduces your flexibility. So here's why I switched two years ago. I was on an elk hunt. I was solo pretty far back and I came upon some caribou and I was maybe 85 yards from this bull and I actually came to full draw on him twice, but A, I wasn't hundred percent sure if he was legal because you need five tines behind like the first rear tine after the front shovel. And I was just, he looked spiky back there, but I didn't have time to like really count. And it was just, it was stressing me out. Plus I was about 25 kilometers from the truck at this point. I was like, you better be sure this is the right animal. Cause you're going to go through hell in a hand basket to try and get this big bastard out. And so I never ended up shooting him. Um, a, I, I didn't really even have a shot either. Like I'm not going to shoot a caribou at 85 yards. It, that's just not in my wheelhouse. Um, but I filmed them on this 24 mil prime and I got back to edit and you, you can't even see the caribou because of the red brush. Like you barely can even make out that there's a caribou there. And that was the limitation of the prime lens that you can't zoom in at all. And after that hunt, I said to myself, I'm going to take the weight penalty of a zoom lens because I need more flexibility in my filmmaking. So now that I can zoom into 70 mil, that gives you almost a 2x optical zoom. 100 mil is 2x um, optical zoom. And for example, a 400 mil is an 8x and a 600 mil is a 12x. So that gives you some idea 
a 400 mil lens is equivalent to a pair of 10x binos as far as the amount of zoom it gives you or the pow- the optical power that it gives you to see things in the distance. So then I switched to this 24 to 70. Now the new 24 to 70 is out. Here's the other benefit of alpha glass. And I'm going to recommend that you buy alpha glass because when you sell it used, you get like 80% of your money back. And I'm even going to go so far as to say the glass you buy is more important than the body you buy. You're going to end up changing bodies every couple of years. You can keep glass almost forever. There's people shooting with 25, 30 year old glass there's, there's people shooting with 25, 30-year-old mechanical bodies as well, but not digital bodies. Like nobody is shooting with a, you know, not many people are shooting with a Canon DSLR from 15 years ago, just because it's so outdated and the new technology is so much cheaper, you're better off just buying new stuff. But that glass lasts almost forever. So I will sell the current 24 to 70 and replace it with the other 24 to 70. Something else I've taken to doing is bringing a secondary lens, a 14 millimeter F1.4 G Master. Now, that is a very light lens. It weighs less than a pound. So that's the only reason I take that lens. And I don't, it's not necessary. So I think if you're just getting into this, I think I would probably recommend a 24 to 70. And there's cheaper versions like um, that you can that you can get. Sigma has uh a second line of lenses. They start with a C. I can't, they're like Sigma Concept or, or something like that. And they're below the Sigma Art lenses and they're really affordable and they they look really decent. You know, they'd be like the Vortex or the Maven of the optics world. Whereas the Sigma Art and the Sony G Master would be like a Leica or a Swaro depending on, you know, what you're into. So that's the secondary lens. And that's more for kind of close up artistic photos where you want that wide lens look that kind of, uh, you can get cool cloud things going on in landscapes and different perspectives. And also I take that for kill shots and for close ups of animals, both with video and photo, because it gives you a really cool perspective. In addition to that, I carry two GoPro Hero 9s. I'll probably sell those this September. Every two years, I normally sell my old GoPros and buy the new GoPros. And I get back like 60 to 70% of my money and then just get the new stuff. Now, as far as mounting equipment goes, I wear a cotton carrier mount on the shoulder strap of my backpack. And that is how I carry my camera 99% of the time. Now, the nice thing about the cotton carrier mount is that you can dual mount tripod mounts to the bottom of your camera with this little attachment that they sell. So I put the outdoorsman's tripod adapter on one side and the cotton carrier adapter on the other side. And what that gives me the ability to do is slide the camera in and out of this shoulder strap holster and then almost simultaneously slide it in and out of any of my outdoorsman's tripods or, you know, supportive gear. I have some other stuff, you know, that I use as well, but you can just go back and forth and you don't have to switch adapters. You don't have to do anything. It's brilliant. It's probably one of the single best things. And I actually saw it in a Stephen Drake vlog. It's probably one of the biggest changes that I've been making. Cause I used to have to have an Allen key and switch out adapters. And it was, and it ended up being such a pain in the ass that you just wouldn't do it. Now with the GoPros, I have a head strap. I have a trekking pole mount. And what I've done is I bought a mountain bike GoPro mount and I twisted it 90 degrees and I mounted it to my trekking pole. And then I have a smaller gorilla pod. Now a gorilla pod is a tripod that's made up of those little balls and you can twist the legs around things. So let me, and this is a big part of kind of the second cheaper recommendation that I'm going to make. So I'm going to spend some time getting into this, especially when you're solo filming, having a variety of ways to mount GoPros that don't require your hands is really important because 
one of the limitations of solo filming is that you only have so many perspectives you can offer. Whereas when you're filming other people, it's a lot easier to have variety in your shots. So it makes it feel interesting, visually interesting to the somebody who's watching. And when you're solo filming, and if you watch people who early solo film, their films are the same. They're either walking and talking to the camera or they're walking and they're showing where they're walking. And it's just this, the same two shots again and again and again. And after 10 minutes, you're like, I can't do this anymore. This is boring as shit. And so the struggle is how do I get different perspectives while being by myself? And I'm not a fan of the walk ahead, leave a camera, walk back, walk past the camera. I kind of think it's bullshit. And to be honest, it takes me out of, there's this concept called the suspension of disbelief. And when you're watching, you know, films or art or whatever, or reading a story, the great ones suspend your disbelief and you forget that you're watching a, a, something somebody's created and you just get drawn into it. And I find things like going ahead, leaving a camera, going back and then walking past it. Remy Warren does this all the time. And I'm like, I know you're by yourself, bro. I know you just, you're walking this the second time for no reason. And it, I don't know, I find it, I find it oddly frustrating. So I don't do it in my films, but I'm almost hamstringing myself because you're, you're limiting yourself. But I also feel like there's this struggle about integrity and authenticity. So I don't do it. So with the head strap, I, I, I have two GoPros. I leave one mounted to the head strap at all times. And I leave that in the hip belt pocket of my backpack. And then a moment's notice, I can just put it on my head. Sometimes I just turn it on while I'm walking. I'll turn it on while I'm on a stock. I'll turn it on while I'm doing things, filling up water containers, uh, setting up my tent, all kinds of stuff. And it gives me that really nice first person perspective, but it doesn't require my hands so I can do things. Now the trekking pole mount what that allows me to do is hold it out from my body. So when you're walking along a cool ridge, you can hold the camera you know, six feet away if you extend your trekking pole, maybe not quite six feet, but yeah, with your, with your adding you know, a foot, two feet for your arm, sure, six feet away. And you can kind of hold it up at an angle. And if you angle the GoPro just right, you don't even get the trekking pole in frame. So it just looks like there's this behind the shoulder shot. It looks really cool. You can hold it out over things. You can lean it against something and do a talking head. Like it's just really, um, it offers a lot of variety. And then with the gorilla pod, what you can do is, um, hard mount it to things. So if you're going to do a time-lapse of glassing or a time-lapse of setting up your tent, you can go find a little sapling and wrap these tripod legs around the sapling, set up your time-lapse, do what you're going to do, and then go get it. So between those three things, I've gone back and forth through all kinds of shit. And now after doing this for five years, those are the three mounts that give me the maximum amount of versatility with the minimum amount of weight penalty. They weigh almost, the head strap is a couple ounces, the trekking pole mount is a couple ounces, and the gorilla pod is a couple ounces. So it's like, it's not even that big of a deal. And it really adds some flexibility and versatility to your shot list. Now for batteries, I carry two Sony batteries. This is the other reason I strongly recommend Sony for the backcountry. Canons are beasts with batteries. Like you would be, there's no way I would do, I'd be carrying 15 pounds of batteries to go on a 10 day hunt with a cannon. Like it's ridiculous. Sony batteries are far superior. I carry two full batteries and lots of times on a seven to 10 day hunt, I won't even go through both full batteries. Like it's wild. Now I don't take an insane amount of pictures and I've gotten better at knowing when to film and when not to film, but um, the battery life is shocking. And then GoPro batteries, on the other hand, are shit. Not only do they run out pretty fast, about an hour runtime each, they'll do random stuff like you charge all six of them and then guaranteed at least two of those, when you go to put them in, there's just no juice in them. So I don't know if they empty out while they're in your pocket or I, I, I got nothing, but they're garbage. Now, in addition to this, because a lot of people asked about power management on hunts, in addition to this, 
I typically carry a 20,000 milliamp hour anchor power pack and a 10,000 milliamp hour power pack. If I'm on a, and I do this for reliability and redundancy because I've been on hunts before where I went in with a power pack, an older power pack, albeit that I thought was fully charged and I took it out and it didn't work. And it, it was almost a really, really bad situation. So I take it for redundancy. When I'm on a shorter hunt, I will carry both at the same time. When I'm on a longer hunt, like this 15 day sheep hunt I'm getting ready for, I will leave one in what I call the strip bag. And that's just a reference to the airstrip. I'm getting dropped off at a lake, but it's just a term. And what I will do at home is I create a second backup bag with all my extra stuff that I want with me in the bush, but I don't need on my person. So extra food, extra batteries, extra bullets, some extra water purification tablets, uh, some fire starter, like just everything extra that it's like just gives you a little blanket of security. I put that all in a dry bag and I mount it up in a tree as soon as I get dropped off by the plane. And then I also know if the shit hits the fan and like a bear stole my food or if I get caught in, in crazy weather and everything gets ruined, I just have to get back to the strip and I'll have enough food and supplies to last me until somebody can come pick me up. The other reason I strongly recommend this is lots of times you're going to plan for a 10 or 12 day fly in hunt. And then at the end, they're not going to be able to come get you right away, weather, other situations and circumstances, and you're going to be stuck out there for an extra couple days. So you better have some extra food with you. So that's the other reason I bring that, that strip bag. And so on a hunt like this, I will likely carry the 20,000 milliamp hour and leave the 10,000 milliamp hour back at the strip bag. I will also bring an Anchor 21 watt solar charger. And these work really good when it's pretty sunny and not so good when it's overcast. And that's why I bring a full 20,000 milliamp hour because if I'm very diligent with my power usage, I can get through a 10 day hunt With all my gear, that's my in-reach, my phone for navigation, my camera gear, everything with the two Sony batteries, the six GoPro batteries, and a 20,000 milliamp hour. But if the sun's out, that gives me the opportunity to be a little bit more flagrant with my power usage. Like I can listen to podcasts at night. Um listen to some music while I'm glassing or, um, you know, take more time lapses and take more photographs that use up a bit more battery. So I'm, I'm always kind of evaluating what's my ability to recharge my batteries. And typically how I do this is I will continually refill the power pack when I can solar charge and then refill my devices from the power pack because the power pack is a known quantity. Like I I have a rough idea how many battery cycles I have in there for the various equipment that I use. Like a 20,000 milliamp hour will basically fill up an iPhone three times. Um, So I I can estimate how many Sony batteries or GoPro batteries I'm going to get out of that. And when I see it going down, and the other thing is power packs tend to die off fast. When you're at 50%, you're probably only at 25%. Like the second half, always goes faster than the first half. So you want to keep that in mind. Now, as far as SD cards go, when you're using really high-end cameras, you need at least a 300 megabyte per second read and write rate, which means you're up into the really expensive cards. So I buy Sony Tough cards, and for the 128 gigabyte cards, they're 300 bucks Canadian a piece. Most hunts... I bring two of these and that gives me uh, two full hours at, because I have this thing cranked up. It's like 4K at uh, 10 bit depth. Like it's, the data rate is really high. That gives me about two full hours of filming. Now I also have two backup. If you're looking to save some money, I can recommend the Lexar, professional cards, the 2000 X's. 
uh, the V90 cards are also 300 megabytes per second. And they're like maybe 120 bucks for 120 gigabyte cards. So they're less than half. I've never had a problem with the Lexar cards. I've never lost data. It's never been an issue for me. So uh, probably not a bad way to save a couple bucks. And I have a little waterproof SD card management that I bought off of Amazon. Now for the GoPro, sorry, I got my SD cards and I'm trying to get one out so I can read what they are. For the GoPro, you got to carry micro SD cards. And again, I tend to use bigger cards. I'll bring a couple 128s and a couple 64s. They're significantly cheaper. I don't know. They might be 30 or 40 bucks a piece. Um, and if you were to add all up everything that I just talked about, you're probably in for 15 grand, I would think something like that, which is kind of crazy. I get it. So let's have a real quick discussion about what I would do. Let's talk about the one step down from there. So the one step down from there, I would recommend a Sony a seven four. It takes really great pictures. It takes really great photos. It's a full frame camera. I just bought one as my backup camera. It was $3,200 Canadian. The Sony A1 is almost $9,000 Canadian, which is, I get it, it's insane. So for a really good DSLR, that's not the absolute top of the line. The Sony a7 IV is my recommendation for sure. And then the rest of the stuff would hold true. I would still recommend a 24 by 70 lens. I would still, the secondary lens is not necessary and you could get away with maybe one GoPro instead of two. And that would, then you could take, you're probably going to still bring the same amount of batteries, but it's going to bring you down to probably more when everything is said and done maybe that like six, seven grand mark. And you're going to really be able to tell some great stories. Now, let's say you want to go down one from there. I would recommend the Sony RX 1000 Mark 7 as a $1,300 US point and shoot camera that has a 20 or nine mil to 75 mil lens. So it, a lot of versatility with that lens aperture goes all the way down to 2.8. So you can get those really nice photos with the shallow depth of field and the bokeh. Um, and then I would say one GoPro and the Sony RX 1000, you're off to the races for everything included less than three grand. And then the very, you know, bottom of the barrel, cheapest option would be your phone. And I would still recommend the GoPro. Like the GoPro is the one thing that I wouldn't sacrifice here because they're so cheap and they're so versatile and the new ones are shooting 5k. The old problem with the, with the GoPros used to be the lenses are so wide and they take such a shot, like a flat picture that it really wasn't that great for storytelling, but because they shoot in 5k, you can crop in and post and give yourself these tighter angles and it still maintains the resolution because they're capturing so much data. All right, that was a little bit quicker than anticipated and I'm sure there's some things that I left out there, but I think that gives you a good idea and some good recommendations for camera uh, gear for the backcountry, particularly from the perspective of a guy who tends to solo hunt most often. So, any other particular questions, please feel free to follow up jay at mindfulhunter.com, Instagram mindful underscore hunter. If you could engage with the platform in any way, I would greatly appreciate it. You know, reviews really help like comment, share, subscribe, share the links with your friends. That would be great. I'm over the moon at the growth of the podcast lately. Like I really feel like we're starting to get somewhere. So thank you so much for the continued support. And until next time, thanks for tuning in.